check the mic and make sure it sound right. Welcome everybody into the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW. And of course, we got the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. BQ. How are we doing this week, BQ? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, excited to talk about this show. So uh, another good episode in a row. I mean, I don't know top to bottom it was good, but it was just it was just good. Like it's uh, obviously the fans play a big role in it, but. I got to a point where I was so bored from week to week, and now I'm like, dude, these these episodes, there's there's some shit going down. Yeah, man. And um, again, you know, for me, <clears throat> the fans delivered strong again this week, and it's giving me life. It's giving me life. It's bringing, it's breathing a whole new life into this show. And if fans, if you can keep delivering, if anybody listening to this is actually in the crowd at Skyway Studios, just know y'all are giving this show a whole new feel. It, y'all are making it seem like a fun place to actually go watch a wrestling show. And if y'all can keep delivering like this, then when Impact gets out on the road, it's going to have a whole different feel. Because the people watching the show at home are going to be like, oh, yeah, that's how we need to act when we go to Impact show. And so when Impact goes on the road, they're going to, you know, they're going to be chanting what you chanted. You know what I mean? They're going to be booing who. Up the P the so oh crucial to so y'all are a big part of the show so if anybody here listening to this gets a chance to go to an impact show scream your ass off be loud have fun and make all the people watching at home feel like that's a place they want to be too there's a level of energy in these shows that even when we were fans prior to the pandemic that just what was non-existent for Bad. for years and I, i've talked about it a lot where i've said impact fans at the shows don't look like they're having fun i mean i've, I've, mm-hmm. I've said that a lot i've compared them to roh and nwa and AEW. like you could put on any of these other shows and the fans are having a blast and i was like i just don't get that from the the impact television audience like they they look bored you know what i mean and this is just mm-hmm. a different level of energy i mean there's chance going on like sometimes they'll do chance previously but it's always like four or five people and then it dies off i mean like people are really into these tapings i just just the look the expressions on these fans faces is like this look of joy watching a product that just i mean completely non-existent for the longest time yeah yeah definitely and so yeah man it's a breath of fresh air y'all are a breath of fresh air fresh air the fans actually watching this this show right now y'all are a breath of fresh air you know what i'm saying thank y'all for you know dropping all your comments in the comment section sharing these videos make sure that by real quick before we get started i'm a little late saying this i usually say this right off the top but go ahead and make sure you subscribe to the channel make sure you like this video and make sure you hit that notification bell so that you get notified each and every time we drop some new content on this channel all right bq you ready to get into the show this week yes 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 sir all right let's do this so <clears throat> we started off with gia miller interviewing scott demore who confirms the rumors that something big is planned for tonight tommy dreamer interrupts and reminds demore that they still don't have a new number one contender for kenny omega's impact world title scott demore receives a phone call and leaves that decision up to dreamers hands what do you think about uh tommy dreamer in the uh you know anthem authority figure role i feel like you already know the answer to that question um <laughs> you know i have it, it's been for a while that i haven't been a fan of tommy dreamer on television i, I just haven't whether wrestling a, a backstage character whatever it is i've just it's gotten really really old to me and that and several months ago, he's like, oh, I'm going to take a break from being on screen. And that lasted like <laughs> three weeks. And he was he was right back in it. And um, I, I, I don't know if I understand the re- this reliance on him. But him is this authority figure and everything. Not only do I dislike it, but I, I dislike it even more because now he's in this tournament. He's in this homecoming tournament. Yeah. So are you a wrestler or are you a representative of Great anthem point. i mean like you can't do both right there right. any wrestling company who's ever had like uh, i don't know if we want to call him an authority figure because it's not like 
really clear. But any wrestling company that's that's blurred the lines between someone calling shots and someone wrestling, they say, well, you, you got to choose both. I mean, I mean, you got to choose one of the two. Even, yeah. dude, NXT years ago when Alex Riley was on commentary, they're like, dude, you can't call the matches and wrestle. You have to choose. Like, it, it, it's just weird. So, no, I mean, you, hit, gonna... you, you hit the nail on the head with that one. Now. You, you're dead right. If you're going to be an authority figure, if, uh, if you're going to be an authority figure, you can't wrestle. Totally agree. You can't do it. It's just weird. It, 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 it's, it's weird. It doesn't make sense. So, because the whole thing about an authority figure is there has to be that element of you're crossing the line if you get physical with them. You know what I mean? And so, if you're going to be, if Tommy Dreamer is going to be the authority figure, which by the way, I actually like Tommy Dreamer in that role. He's an excellent talker. He understands like the psychology of wrestling. So, everything, um, who am I telling? I mean, but you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, he obviously understands like, what emotion you're trying to convey in each interaction in a in a scene that he's in you know what i mean um tommy dreamer is good i just don't want to see him wrestle you know what i mean and 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 it's, it's not and again that's not even anything specifically against tommy dreamer wrestling it's more a fact of whenever i would see tommy dreamer wrestle it felt like impact just having a, a, a fill-in for not having something better right right, right. And that's why i was always like yo get tommy dreamer off my tv because really i was reacting to impact not having like you know some fresh hot star in a spot that he was in you know what i mean but i think in a in a role like this to me this is perfect for tommy dreamer totally perfect i think that's a perfect type of role for him it it works if in in real life if they decide okay don's gone dreamer's gonna step into this role in like real life yeah. I would buy it a lot more on screen, but there's mm. three, there's three people they go to when they're like, when they have to break glass in case of emergency, it's Tommy dreamer, PD Williams and suicide. I thought you were going to say Gail Kim. No, <laughs> oh, no, no. God, <laughs> give me more Gail Kim. <laughs> uh, but uh, right. no, there's, there's three that they, they break that glass in case of emergency. We need, we need a uh, warm body to, to fill this role because we can't think of anything else creative to do. Um, yeah, I was exactly. I was so just I mean, I, I got to talk. I feel like I've talked about Tommy Dreamer every week for years on the, on this podcast and, and everything, everything that I record. I feel like I talk about because he's Dreamer been there the for years. It's not like, yeah. he's making that up. like they've been inserting Tommy Dreamer into unnecessarily into impact storylines for years. And I, it's you had to talk about it. I think I've just been disappointed so many times with, you know, him being the surprise get you know wrestler the or the surprise opponent the surprise partner and now he's a surprise authority figure it's just like dude we have surely there's there's other options you know right. it, it almost lets you know how i i'm i'm totally assuming here i i know nothing but it almost feels like it gives us an idea of how few people are working behind the scenes sometimes yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot about impact that gives you that feeling. Yeah. All right. So we got the Impact World Tag Team Champions, the Good Brothers, Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson, versus the never open weight champion Jay White and Chris Bay. After Jay White and Chris Bay joined the Bullet Club, uh after Jay White asked Chris Bay to join right. the Bullet Club, could they find success as a tag team here tonight? So Bay got the pace going as he usually does. Then, you know, Carl Anderson takes him off his feet with a flying drop kick. Gallows hits Bay with a big boot and a sidewalk slam. Good Brothers cut off the ring, try to wear down Chris Bay. Chris Bay does his, 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 his high-flying cross body to uh, Gallows and makes the tag to Jay White, gets the hot tag. He comes in, hitting Anderson with a suplex or two. Gallows brawls with Jay White on the outside. A few minutes later, Gallows catches Bay in midair. With the choke slam, then they hit Chris Bay with the magic killer. Chris Bay takes the pin for the one, two, three. Good brothers get the win. What'd you think about this match here? First of all, this is the best thing that could happen in Chris Bay's career right now, being associated with Jay White with the, with the Bullet Club, which is still, it's not at the height that it was at one point, but it's still a fairly popular faction. And this is one of the dudes for Impact that that has that real elite talent um, that, that just, deserves to be appreciated by you know by the wrestling world in general i found the placement of this match interesting because i think you had said last week i think it was you i think we talked about on the podcast or maybe i was talking to someone else but how odd it was that it wasn't the main event that they went with moose and saban instead Hmm. and traditionally 
in with wrestling ratings, usually less people are watching the main event than actually watching the beginning of the show. Hmm. I was um I was looking at some uh a breakdown of AEW ratings today and hmm. I was actually very shocked. This was the one where the the main event was uh Nick Gage and Chris Jericho. Yeah, yeah. I was I was actually shocked that there was as many people in the main event that in the beginning of the show and there was it it dipped down in the middle. Yeah. But I, I couldn't believe how many people were still watching at the end. And I think that's yeah. been one of the exceptions. I mean, for like the most part, people, you know, are kind of watching a show and halfway through they're like, okay, change the channel or mm-hmm. it's ti- I'm tired. I, I got to watch, like I was watching the NBA draft last night. I watched half of it. I was like, I'm going to bed. I'll watch the rest right. tomorrow. You know, I got it on DVR. So mm-hmm. um, I was, I feel like the placement of this match was like, okay, this is where majority of the eyes are probably watching. Let's get Jay White on here now, you yeah. know. So it, it it was a good match. I'm I'm liking a br- good brothers more the less that they talk. Yeah. Uh, did you see their uh their match with uh the the elite against the Dark Order on AEW where they were? Elite I did. With... I did. That was actually that I, I really enjoyed that. I I, I mostly enjoyed it. I well, think some of the stuff they do is just too cool. The match was good, but I, I was I was gonna say the the entrance to the ring with the silly jerseys yeah. and the basketball yeah. and inter- like yeah that was i hated whack. that so much that was really whack yeah and then the thing they did where um the young bucks did the what they call it, the Meltzer driver but the they tried to dunk the ball into it i was just a lot of it just came off as corny and then like a lot of um it was like uh the young bucks and kenny omega took turns dunking on the what was clearly like a seven foot hoop <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, and i was just like man these guys are so corny um but hey, you know it is what it is. Um, I I like your point about the the placement of the match because all wrestlers usually say if I'm not gonna go on last, I want to go on first. And so you're right. That does that that is a great point. If somebody is looking for something to watch and it's eight o'clock and you're somebody who knows who Jay White is, <clears throat> put them on at eight o'clock so people right. can see him. I've noticed you know the last Raw, SmackDown, and SmackDown have all began with John Cena's entrance. First thing you hear on the show. Why? Because you want to put something hot at the top of the show. Right, and so right. so totally makes sense for this to be uh, where this match gets placed. Um, I do like Chris Bay being associated with the Bullet Club. I think it's honestly best for all parties because the Bullet Club needs to keep having, you know, a fresh name uh, in the yeah. Bullet Club to keep them relevant too. Um but I hate that Chris Bay had to eat the pin here. I hate it. I mean, I understand I, that, yeah. um, you know, the Good Brothers and Jay White are all like more valued talents, probably in the eyes of the company. But I just hate that Chris Bay had to be the one to eat the pin here. But the truth is, like all real wrestling fans know, if you're really a star, it doesn't matter if you eat a pin every now and then. It doesn't hurt you at all because Chris Bay still going to be Chris Bay when I turn on my TV next week. So You know what I didn't like, though? Chris Bay looked like Kofi Kingston in this match. Like physically? F- yeah. His, I mean, his hairstyle, he always wears it like that. It's similar. Mm-hmm. But he was wearing the New Day colors, his his ring gear. The New Day has lots of colors. Yeah, but but, I, I but can, I'm talking about totally that see, pink. I can and, totally see how you could how you could make that um that connection. But Chris Bay's gear actually really resembles Shawn Michaels' gear. Really? I don't, yeah, if I you, can't. If, 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 next time you see Chris Bay and look at like some 90 Shawn Michaels and you'll see Chris Bay's gear really is, I think, kind of patterned after Shawn Michaels gear. Interesting. And it really kind of stuck out to me like a couple of times he come in here, like open his ring jacket and kind of do that thing right there. You know, <laughs> and so I think that, uh, you know, like you can really you can tell that he's kind of playing off the whole Shawn Michaels thing. So, you know, I, I think that I think that that's definitely where he he has his uh his influence for his gear. All right. Backstage we see Falaba ask Tasha Steels to be to enter the homecoming king and queen tournament and shockingly she accepts. Uh do you like this pairing of Tasha Tasha Steels and Falaba? No, I don't at all. Fire and Fala? Um, or fa- Fala and Flavor? Fala and Flavor that's <laughs> funny as shit. Um but no I don't uh you know we'll get to Falaba later but it's we talked last week when he had the match with Austin Aries and it was like, okay, it was this great match and they probably could have 
created him into a more serious character. And then when they were teaming with TJP, they were doing that a little bit, but then he's just fallen back into this comedy role. Mm. And you, I like the dude, but sometimes when you, when you, when you fall into a certain niche, it's like anyone associated with you goes down with you. And I, True. you know, I, I just don't, I, I have a hard time, you know, she's getting ready to go on a singles run, obviously, or maybe she's going to have a partner show up, you know what I'm saying? But, I, well, I just, you know, it's a it's, weird pairing for me. Interesting that you mentioned that, right? Like, I think she should go on a singles run because she has the best charisma out of any woman uh, in that whole knockouts division. But we don't know if they see her like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't know if the company sees that in her. So if they don't, then she's going to, you know, she's going to do stuff like this. She's going to bounce around and, and do random things and this and that. And then they'll throw her in there to lose to Rosemary. So it depends on how the company sees her, you know? Um, I sure hope, you know, they see her for, you know, for the star that she is. And they just give her a chance to shine. I'm not saying put a title on her, but prominently feature her. Yeah. And just let the world see what she can do. Because I see it, man. I see it. Like, anytime she talks... You know, it, it's uh, it's fun. Um, you know, she's a good wrestler. And, you know, like we just said, the character piece is there. So I hope they see the value in Tasha Steels because I think she could be great for them. I agree. Um, all right. So Kayla with a K and Tennille Dashwood versus <laughs> Taylor Wilde. So Taylor Wilde is back and she's coming after Tennille Dashwood. But first, she's got to get through Dashwood's personal photographer, Caleb with a K. Taylor goes for a hurricane rider, but Caleb counters into a clothesline. Taylor avoids the incoming charge from T Caleb, then successfully hits the hurricane rider. Caleb comes right back with a super kick for two. Uh, the fight spills outside where Taylor connects with a tornado DDT. Then Taylor hits a bit, a bridge German suplex to score the victory. Taylor Wilde gets the pin on Caleb with a K. What'd you think about this? You know, I actually kind of like this match. When it, when it first was getting ready to happen, I was like, "What what the hell is this?" Um, I, I I I envision this comedy match where a bunch of silly spots were happening. Caleb with a K was getting no, you know, was going to get no kind of real offense in there. I just thought it was going to be a BS match, and I mean, they actually put together a pretty decent match. Uh, you know. They found a fairly tasteful way of, of doing intergender wrestling where it's not the it. Lucha yeah. Underground style where it's, you know, they're, they're hitting them just like, you know, just like, just like the Tessa Blanch Blanchard matches. I mean, just, just hitting her like she's a dude. Yeah. They found a pretty tasteful way. And the complete opposite was when they were doing the World Title Series years ago before they transitioned over oh. Pop and Dixie, Dixie Carter's like, the knockouts are going to be in this World Title Tournament. <laughs> it's like, okay. And and the matches were just laid out so poorly and there was no... There's like no action whatsoever. There's always some kind of BS roll-up finish or something. Yep. You know, so whoever put this match together for them, I thought did a good job to where... Caleb wasn't totally a comedy character. Like he, you know, showed that he could wrestle and uh, he's coming. He's, he's really falling into his own with this, with this gimmick, just the, with the bleaching of the hair and his, his, his physique was looking good today too. I feel like he's, he's really been, uh, been working hard. So, um, yeah, I was, uh, you know, I thought, uh, I was, I was entertained by it. I, I was, yeah. uh, the one thing I kind of took away at the end, I, I touched on this a little bit last week when she hit that, you know, the German suplex. I'm just like, man, Impact really lacks uh, like real high impact finishers, like the ones that you mm. you can't wait to see the move hit. Like I, right. I'm just throw, pulling this out of my ass. Like you know, when back when Matt Seidel was the one who was doing the shooting our star press the most. Now everyone mm. seems to do those kind of moves, but you couldn't wait for that, or you couldn't wait for pack to do the black arrow you know yeah those are kind of extreme examples but but sometimes you you have these finishers where you just you, you can't wait for them to bust it out yeah and i don't get that with a lot of the impact wrestlers i mean just very standard finishers cutters and you know mm -hmm. uh and, you know I, I think there's about three people who use the cutter chris bay does tasha Steeles does uh carl anderson does that that's three right off 
right off right. the bat for their finishers. You know, so I just I don't remember if that's always been her finish. Uh, Taylor Wilde has, you know, captured German suplex because I know she's won with mm. it before on Impact, but it's it's like, dude, come on, it's just something, it's, right, something more Impact. But I think yeah. again, that's a little more on the company not promoting these people, right? Like, tell everybody that the most electrifying move is the art of finesse. Like, Chris Bay can hit this out of anywhere. Like, make a big deal out of it. Like, right, you know, right. Impact. I feel like you 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 mentioned earlier about things that make you feel like impact is just working with a really skeleton staff. And that's another one of those things. Like maybe they don't have a person uh, available to, um, to cut up Chris Bay promos just to air, you know what I mean? And and put out on social media, but they need somebody to do that. You know what I mean? I mentioned before about you got fans back in the building, excited for the first time in a year and a half you need to be, you need to have somebody out there interviewing those people standing in line. I can't wait to get in and see Tennille Dashwood. You know what I mean? Like you need to be be cutting this stuff up and putting it online. But if you don't have, you know, if, if you don't have anybody on staff to do that, if you don't have anybody on payroll to do that, like you're just not going to get it. You know what I mean? Because Josh Matthews has apparently hustled his way all the way up through this company. You know what I mean? Like I, right. think, I think he's damn near the top of impact right now. So, um, <laughs> You know, and 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 from what I've been hearing, like from even when they first hired him, you know, one of the things they were saying is, "Oh, he's in charge of this, and he's in charge of that." And I think, you know, you know, when he came in there, he sold them on the fact that he's, you know, uh, just just hip and current and right. and and with the times on everything. And listen, maybe he is, but. He's only got two hands. You know what I mean? Like you need people dedicated to doing these things. You know what I mean? So hire up a staff. Listen, if you're in Nashville, th- how many colleges are in the Nashville area? Like I, I, that's just a rhetorical question, but I'm sure there's a bunch, right? Like get do some internships, get some media st- study students for, you know, give them credit, you know, give them, give them credit hours to come in and cut video for you. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it, it's really not that hard, man. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not that hard. You just got to think smart. And again, you know, people are like, oh, Impact, they don't have money for that. That's bull. Impact, they do. The, the, the company that owns Impact bought a TV network from Mark Cuban. They right. have money. OK, it's just all about like the do they trust the people in charge of Impact or the people in charge of Impact? Um you know, are they asking for this? You know what I mean? Are they asking for, hey, can I have, you know, can I have, uh, you know, three three salaries for social media specialists? You know what I mean? Like, are, yeah. are, are they doing that? You know what I mean? Or are they trying to, you know, turn as much of a profit as possible to keep their own jobs or to, you know, maybe it's one of those things. Uh, there's a clip from the office uh, where Toby's trying to explain to Michael that they have to spend a certain amount of the budget so that they get the same amount of budget allocated the following year. And Michael's yeah. like, explain it to me like I'm a six-year-old. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I'm just thinking about that. Like, as I'm talking about like impact, like, do they not understand? You got to spend money to do more stuff. And maybe, uh, you know, maybe they do understand, right? And, and maybe they're just trying to uh, come in under budget so they get more bonus or something. I don't know. But the point is, they could use some extra people to do some of these seemingly common sense things to make their product look more, um, more alive. Yeah, no, that was a great example. All right. So we're going to run through a couple of backstage segments they had uh, after Chris Bay was pinned for the tag team match earlier in the night. Jay White tells him that he's not Bullet Club material, but he's willing to give him a chance at redemption. Then we see uh, Josh Alexander. He's talking to Scott Demore, and he demands more competition. Scott Demore says, "Hey, I was just trying to give you a break because you've been going. You know, you've been you've been running hard with the Iron Man match and the Ultimate X." And uh, Josh Alexander <laughs> says he doesn't want to break. That's the kind of guy he is right now. And so Scott Demore makes a match for uh, Black Tarus getting the X Division title shot against Josh Alexander this Saturday at Homecoming. All right. Then we see Deanna Perrazzo. She reveals that she has been diversifying her training with help from Invicta FC 
atom weight champion Alicia Zapatella. Uh, Deanna Perazzo says she'll be competing in the homecoming king and queen tournament, but the identity of her partner will remain a mystery. Okay, so I threw a lot at you right there. What'd you think of those backstage segments and stories? So the Josh Alexander thing, I liked it. First of all, I liked it visually because he wasn't, uh, it wasn't like when Fire and Flavor was talking and it's that same star in the background, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You could tell everything's shot in like four areas of the arena. Yes. This was, this was like different, like a completely different, you know, he wasn't hanging out in a broom closet. Uh, it, ju it just looked more professional and we got him on screen and that kind of thing. Sometimes, sometimes you have the right type of backstage segment or the right kind of promo and you don't have to put someone on that's on TV wrestling too much. You know what I yeah. mean? And I just thought this was good to advance him without putting him on the screen wrestling necessarily. And the story made sense. You know, Scott's like, I gave you a break and this was a couple segments in a row a couple of weeks in a row where Scott wasn't trying to like pop you when he came on the screen. Like he's, yeah. he, he has been, he comes off and he tries to be funny. And then he always gets the last word on the wrestler. Always. He gets right. in and oh, he <laughs> walks around, walks away and you're, you know, trying to crack jokes. <laughs> and he just came off like more authoritative this time. And, and just, you know, so I appreciated that. I, I think the headphones thing has to be some kind of inside joke. The headset where he just <laughs> walks in and he takes it out. Like it has, to, there's got to be some kind of like inside joke that we're not, we're not getting. Um, I think it's one of those things where like, it's supposed to be like, if you are, so the show's running whenever we're watching it. Right. So in theory, we're seeing backstage during a live taping of the show. Right. Right. And if he's in the gorilla position, right? Like, so a lot of times if you're producing from um, what in most setups would be the truck, you're wearing a headset where you can communicate with the directors, communicate with the producers, communicate with the referees in this case, whatever. Like you're sitting there and you got, you know, on the screen in front of you, you got like all of these cameras and all of these shots. And so like you're telling the director, give, give me some crowd over here. Give me some, give me some crowd, give me some crowd and then bring it back to this girl over here with the sign. Okay, now give me reaction from uh, Chris Bay. All right, now, uh, you know, whatever. So like you're, right. you, you're doing all that. So you would wear a headset, right? Because it has, it, it's the heads, it's the same thing that he's wearing, right? So you would wear a headset like that. And I guess the, the what, what they're trying to show is like, he's, he's still working. Right. So he needs to go back to, I guess, gorilla position at any moment. But he's also putting these different fires out around the show at the same time. Yeah, because he's freely walking around a lot. So right. it's hard to hard to imagine him even sitting and having the headphones on with any volume in it. No producer does in. that. No, no, but, no producer. Really does right, that. right. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. So but, we had but, one with it. I'm sorry, well, you're saying? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I like that segment. But, not, but then uh, as far as the Deanna one. At first, I put it on mute because the minute I heard <laughs> we own the night mute, you know, that that's just what I'm doing every time. Now I hear that. Boom. But something told me, you know what? Let me listen to this one. So uh, G does G is getting way better with the mic, by the way. Uh, she had a segment earlier where there were so many people coming in the screen and she was putting the mic in front of everyone. And I was just like, this is so ridiculous because everybody, nobody, the mic's not even on. You know, like it don't matter right. where someone's standing, you can hear them just the same. It's just yeah. this. But anyway, I, I liked the promo she was saying. Yeah, bring an old girl out is a really good touch. If they, if they have her on screen with Deanna, I think that's going to be just add a new wrinkle to it, to mm -hmm. her character. Uh, you know, a legit badass athlete who, who looks good too. So, who okay. I think has a little wrestling training. A lot of fans have been trying to say, Hey, you should be a knockout. And she's retweeting that stuff and all that. So yeah, it was, it was a nice little, little segment. And it was good because it gave him an opportunity to finally acknowledge the match with Fabio Apache at triple mania yes. title versus yes. title. And then, you know, throw in the NWA thing there a little bit and just paint mm -hmm. this picture that she is a working fighting champion. And just, I loved in that interview where, uh Gia Miller asked her, Are you doing too much? And she goes, Would you say that to Kenny Omega? Yes. I love that line. Great. I love that line because I was thinking to myself, I think we've all been thinking as impact fans, is 
you know, when is Impact going to get an opportunity to look like they have somebody who can go out and dominate in different promotions as well? And I think we've all accepted that this Kenny Omega thing, this is a Kenny Omega story and Impact is just playing a part in it. And again, I think we're all fine with that. But if that's the case, then why don't we tell a Deanna Perazzo story? Mm -hmm. Because she's she's down. of her being presented on and go which does so here we had the match where apparently they just wanted to get everybody in it was Falaba, No Way and Finjuice, David Finley, Juice Robinson against Ace Austin, Madman Fulton Rohit Raju and Shira Woo! why are all these people fighting each other? Who knows? Right. But after being targeted by Ace Austin, Madman Fulton, Rohit Raju, and Shira, the team of Finjuice, Falaba, and the recently debuted No Way join forces for tag team action. Fala gets Irish whipped by his own partners as they send him crashing into Fulton. Rohit intervenes, allowing his team to gain control with a series of quick tags. Fala fights off, off the headlock, then sits on Ace to create separation. Finley enters the fray as he takes out Rohit with a backbreaker. Shira brings his momentum to a halt, but uh, pays for it as Finjuice dropkick him to the floor. No way hits a pop-up punch on Rohit. Fala catches Fulton in midair and plants him to the mat with a Samoan drop. Ace Austin flies over the top out to everybody with a Fonsbury flop. That shit looked crazy, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and Finley hits the trash panda Trash Panda, that's a great name for a move. <laughs> Absolutely, dude. To score the victory for his team. This was a lot. What did you think of this move here? I There's mean, like a, a minor league baseball team, I think, in Alabama or something. That's the Trash Pandas. I was like, Trash Yo, Panda. that is that is amazing. <laughs> It sounds like a shitty rock band. Yeah, absolutely. This uh <laughs> you know, I didn't care for this match because I didn't I just didn't care. Felt oh, super I, random. I yeah, I said after Slammiversary when when Finn Juice basically embarrassed Fulton and Shira, I was like, I have no reason to care about these guys going forward. Like at this point, especially Fulton has lost so many times uh, mm. in, in environments where they shouldn't lose or they shouldn't lose in the manner that, that they do. I was like, these two guys, again, especially Fulton, how do you fucking fix them at this point? You know, yeah. Fulton, they paint him as this monster for a little bit and, and, you know, he he's always been associated with losing, whether it was OVE who lost every week or him losing. Right. And he starts off the match and he's struggling with Falaba. Mm-hmm. So I'm just I'm kind of like mentally checked out of this match initially. He's he's just struggling with him. Tries to slam him, can't like he's trying to slam Andre the Giant or something, <laughs> uh, which I guarantee you he can pick Falaba up. And you know there was comedy going on and. In the whole time he was in the match before he tagged out, he did absolutely nothing. And I'm, I'm just like, I mean, he just, there was no momentum on his end, no offense, nothing. He was just, he was just embarrassed. And and I was just like, are we supposed to believe that, uh, you know, Fulton and Shearer both, you know, are, uh, the team that they're on is going to win this match? I mean, right. And you got two former X Division champions. There's no doubt in my mind what the outcome of the match was going to be. And I, I just, I just didn't care. I, I just I hate seeing when a, a legit a guy with legitimate size just continues to lose on a regular basis, and um, I just I just didn't enjoy it. You know, there was some yeah. good wrestling in it, but I I think I was so checked out from the beginning of the match that it it, it was a little difficult for me to and you know enjoy it from there. Yeah, now this definitely felt like a match just for the sake of having a match. Um, I loved when Ace Austin did the Fosbury flop. I thought that just that just looks so crazy. This dude is a crazy, ridiculous athlete. And it's good to see them doing stuff like that and finally getting a reaction from fans. Because they've been these guys have right. been there busting their tails for this whole time in front of nobody. And it's just good to hear them getting the reaction they that they're working for from fans. So that was cool. Um, you know, I think we know that Finn Juice is in the protected class here. So, you know, they're going to get kept strong. And so I, I think, you know, I'd have been shocked to see them take a pin in this match. So this match was what it was. Is it going somewhere? Probably. Do we care? 
Big no. maybe. All right. <laughs> oh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, Tommy Dreamer informs Impact World Champion Kenny Omega that in two weeks, there'll be a battle royal to determine the new number one contender for the Impact World title at Emergence, which I didn't even know was coming up. But now you know. I saw weeks, that. It, 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 I think a match or so before that, it just showed Emergence. And I saw it was in like two weeks. And I was just like, yo, we got this Impact Plus show this weekend. And now this this show all of a sudden just out of the blue is is showing up. When I first saw it, I thought it was the New Japan pay-per-view. I don't even remember what it was called. I think it's something similar to that. Yeah. Hmm. So I Well no no. I don't so in two weeks there'll be a battle royal, but does that mean that he's gonna defend the title at emergence or is emergence in two weeks? I think it's both because it it well, let me say not both. I want to say it said the fourth, the fourteenth was, so the first is on a Sunday. So that me, it's interesting. I, I don't know. Sometimes you just got to look at a calendar. Yeah, you forget that there's like we always assume there's four weeks in every month, and it's usually like closer to five. So, true. I, I I would say that the episode of Impact before the pay per view is or the Impact Plus show is probably what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we were looking at calendar, I'm sure we could figure it out fairly easily, but uh, I'm sure we'll figure it out as the weeks go on. All right, <laughs> let's see what we got here. Uh, Jay white and Chris Bay blindside Finn juice in the backstage. And uh, Jay, uh, Jay white sends a message to his new Japan resurgence opponent, David Finley. Um, so we see Chris Bay, you know, getting into some gang fights to try and impress the bullet club. Impact World Champion Kenny Omega, Impact World Tag Team Champions, the Good Brothers, and the Invisible Hand Don Callis are in the ring. Callis is furious that Tommy Dreamer booked a number one contender's battle royal in two weeks to determine Omega's next challenger. Sammy Callahan interrupts and says that he's going to win the battle royal, but first, he and two partners will take on Omega and the Good Brothers in a six-man tag next Thursday. Then out of nowhere, AEW star and Impact veteran Frankie Kazarian jumps the guardrail and attacks them from behind. Um, on the other side of the curtain, after the brawl was over, Tommy Dreamer whispers the name of who he has in mind to be Sammy Callahan and Frankie Kazarian's partner next week. Kazarian likes what he hears, but Callahan doesn't think he'll <laughs> go for it. Um, then we're just going to... I, you, you know what I'm, I'm I gotta give you say. All these segments, and then we'll, we'll. You know what? Let's 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 pause there and tell me what you think so far of that segment right there. Okay, so first you see, you you actually said it. New Japan has resurgence, and then Impact has emergence. Like, <laughs> why would you have such a similar title so close? Because of the urgency. The, the urgency, yeah. <laughs> I also noticed that you know we have homecoming. GCW had homecoming, the one where Cardona beat a. Nick Gage, and then I think that was the homecoming show, or they have the next one coming up called Homecoming. And then nah, if you don't have TV, you don't AW, count. what's that? So if you don't have TV, you don't count. Yeah, it, right. Yeah, true. I guess so. But it's been in the new wrestling news a lot. And then uh, AEW true. has Homecoming coming up as well. Some kind of Homecoming show. I'm just like, all these names are just like running into each other. It's very, it's weird. But so what was cool about this? Uh, this Frankie Kazarian thing was that the crowd really reacted to this. And we have had times in the past where someone has come out of the audience or there's been some kind of, you know, I remember when Petey Williams returned after being gone forever and hits a <laughs> Canadian destroyer and the fans are sitting there, oh, yeah. you know, sitting on their hands, <laughs> you know, um, it was just nice to hear this like reaction and the welcome backs. And, you know, when he left, he, he, he mouthed, you know, the Oladipo, uh, this is my house. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, but, uh, that's my other team, the Pacers. So I don't, I don't talk Oladipo <laughs> anymore, but, uh, so I, I like that it was quick. It wasn't like last week we got a very, even though I enjoyed it, a very long drawn out, segment in the ring with microphones and talking was Kenny Omega wearing the same exact clothes as last week. Probably. I don't, bro, Kenny I, Omega I'm almost so positive, dude. As a matter of fact, when I'm watching it, I was like, am I watching last week's segment? 
you know that it looked exactly like it uh when, when they were all coming out so that's horrible you know i pointed it out about josh matthews a while ago when he when him and madison rain were doing the uh you know the the outtake stuff between matches yeah. and he always had the same exact fucking outfit on and madison raid had the <laughs> wherewithal to change her outfit from week to week you know i'm just like Ugh. so right. um but anyway it was quick and effective like he came out he cleared house he didn't grab a microphone and start talking and you know like it was just it, it left you with like a what's next you know what i mean mm -hmm. did i did i pick up on that he wanted tommy dreamer to be their partner did he say it was, Oof, oof, I thought he not. said that at first, and he's like, "No, no, I, I got someone better." I didn't hear I didn't exactly. catch that, but that would have been upset. If that was I would have died. But honestly, I think the person they, they picked wasn't much better. So you know, spoiler alert: we'll skip ahead here. The person they ended up picking to be the third <laughs> partner was uh, Eddie Edwards, and I feel like hasn't Eddie Edwards been in at least two or three tag matches against With, uh, Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers? Yeah, absolutely has. So, yeah, I mean, it, th this is one of those times you're, you're getting into, it feels like there's a pattern. It's just rehashing going over and over again. We'll do the triple throw. I mean, we'll do the, the six man tag, then Omega single match. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I wish that they would freshen it up a little. So I'll use, you know, I'm sure people hate our AEW examples, but, you know, <laughs> it's the other company I watch pretty religiously. So. They have a lot of stables, obviously, within that company, but it's not like the same people from the stables wrestle all the time. Like, right. let's say the Hardy family office, you know, you'll get there's a there had a six man match this week. It was like private party and um, Jack Evans or in Helico, one of the two. Or right. they'll just be like Matt Hardy and the Blade, which that's not even the Blade's tag team partner, but they, they still sw switch it up within the stables. Yeah. Which allows things to be kind of fresh you know what i mean and it's yeah. consistently kenny and the good brothers kenny and the good brothers like mm -hmm. if just one mat one week you're just like kenny uh as i say kenny rogers kenny omega and, <laughs> and carl, kenny rogers yeah and kenny <laughs> and, and and uh carl anderson and willie nelson <laughs> yeah and <laughs> oh god no, if it was just like hey it's kenny omega and, and carl anderson this week against Kazarian and and Sammy Callahan that that right. feels so much fresher mm -hmm. than uh, you know again Eddie Edwards in another six man match this is like his third one yeah put and Omega then, in a triple threat put him in a four way something you know something different switch it up right the pattern right. is starting to feel a little repetitive but I do want to give Kenny Omega credit though because he is wrestling a champion schedule uh yeah. for Impact so you know credit to Omega credit to you know, uh, to AEW for allowing it. Um, but he's certainly not shorting impact on being the champion. So I, I definitely give him credit for that. You know, and, and they were <clears throat> every week to week, they were doing Gia standing in front of the, the locker room, hoping to talk to Kenny Omega. And it was always yeah. Don Callis coming out. And finally, Kenny came out. So it was like, they were telling a little story there, you know, that it was making it come across as if he probably wasn't even like the smart wrestling fans. Like he probably wasn't even there. Right. Um, but now he actually he actually stepped out, so it it was <laughs> a little build up to it. But you know, <laughs> it happened, right? <laughs> He's here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So backstage, we see Sue Young, and it appears as though Kimberly's time has come. Uh, then we see Brian Myers tr <laughs> trying to talk to ECW legend Francine, asking her to be his partner. She basically just rejects him. All right, what do you think of these two segments? So I called this shit last week that it was either last week or the week before that Kimberly was going to come out like a Sue Young character. Yep, I think you did definitely mention that. Yeah, so I can't believe I actually got something right. I've been calling stuff for a while, and I have been wrong for like what feels like a good year, year and a half now. <laughs> and I finally, I think the last time I was right on something is when I when I called uh, Taya Valkyrie challenging uh, – Tessa Blanchard being her next opponent as, as right. a baby face, baby face Taya. And it's okay. It you don't have happened. to tell people that you're wrong. Just keep bragging about the times you're right. <laughs> don't mention the times you're I'm wrong. just saying like, I, I have to admit, you know, uh, when I'm wrong and I've been, I've been wrong for a while. So <laughs> I actually, I got to take credit for this one. 
not take credit, but I, I got to uh, blow my head up a little because I that's where to me, logically, it was going because after mm-hmm. like Susan cannot continue. No. Clearly, Sue Young was coming back. So th- it just made sense to to go that route. So I I was so excited when I saw that pop up on the screen. I love the makeup she had and everything. I'm very jazzed for this, like very freaking excited for it. It makes yeah. me feel like it was worth sitting through all this Susan stuff, which I didn't really particularly care for. So I'm super, super jazzed. And what what was after it? What did you say? Uh, we had Francine. Uh, Brian Myers is on the on on his phone. He had Francine on the That's phone right. trying to ask her to be <laughs> his partner for Homecoming. I I didn't know she had a podcast called Eyes Up Here, and I I. I <laughs> I was like, I'm going to look that up. But speaking of eyes down there, like I definitely was staring there watching her on the phone. (laughs) But this was well done. Uh, I don't think she was live on the phone. It's very possible they were playing a recording. Definitely. Uh, And Brian Myers interacted with it very, very well. I agree. I, I, I thought he just, everything he does, I think we both agree is like, it's just been really good. And I like Sam Beal in this role quite a bit. Um, it's perfect for him because when he first when he was first on the impact screen, I was like, "Who's this?" Right. You know, but they found the right, uh, right guy to pair him with, the right character, and I love it. I'm I'm really into it. And um, I've heard I don't know who the partner is. I heard it's pretty disappointing though. That hmm. for for Brian Myers. So it's gonna be Susan, probably Susan. Yeah, <laughs> that would suck. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I I thought the segment was cool. I would have loved if it really was Francine. That would have been great. Uh, yeah, I know. But it but it was a nice touch. It was a nice touch to put her in it. So I, I enjoyed the segment. I thought it was cool. All right. So we had Violent by Design, Diener and Rhino, that combination, with Eric Young and Joe Doring against Rich Swan and Willie Mack. So after losing the Impact World Tag Team titles at Slammiversary, Violent by Design placed the blame on Rich Swan and Willie Mack. Following VBD's blindside attack on them last week, Rich and Willie are out for revenge in this tag team collision. Diener and Rhino attacked them before the bell to gain an early advantage. Rich and Willie turn the tide as Swan flies with a corkscrew to the floor. Moments later, EY distracts Swan by waving the VVD flag, which allows Diener to regain control. Swan makes the tag to Willie, who hits Diener with a standing moonsault for two. Rich hits Rhino with a handspring cutter, followed by the Phoenix Splash to win. And I already didn't love Violet by Design, but to me, I feel like they're super dead now. What they're do you think? They're dead. Of this? They were dead as the champions, dude. Uh, they need Eric Young to wrestle like very badly. They're doing what I said though. They they do switch it up within the team with who's who's wrestling and who's you know. It's not like it's Joe Doring, Rhino, and Diener every single week against another threesome. <laughs> I mean, I use that term three man team. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, <laughs> uh, they need Eric Young to wrestle very badly. I think. <sighs> Violent by Design's a great is great in theory, but the pieces are just so odd to me. Yeah, they this Eric Young and Diener look great together, and then Rhino looks very random. He's still wearing the regular Rhino gear, the ECW stuff, and then you got Joe Doring playing like it's like my 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 daughter when she was like five playing dress up, going in the closet and just gra- grabbing random stuff, putting it on and stepping out. Yeah, you know that's what that's what this dude. Like, I don't understand his look even a little bit. Um, but I didn't, I didn't care in the sense that violent by design is just so dead to me. I mean, they didn't, they're not even teasing that these guys are going to get a, a rematch for the title. I mean, they, we, well, we always know they pick and choose this rematch clause crap. Uh, that's why I like that. AEW just doesn't do it. Period. Uh, yeah. impact picks and chooses. They always have. And, it lets you know what they think of the talent, I guess. But it was clear yep. that this these were placeholder champions. You know, they there was n- never uh, anything in the. You know, Finn Juice is not going to get their revenge on Bi- Violent by Design. Nothing like that. It was just we just need someone to hold the belts for a little bit. We need to make it look like this Call Your Shot trophy means something because we dropped the ball last year. Um, I, I'm I'm going to say Violent by by Design is not going to get interesting until Heath comes back. 
uh, because, it, and the reason I say that is because Rhino was his partner, and I feel like, and, and I I enjoy what Heath does on the screen, so I feel like once he returns, things are going to get a little more interesting. But that that stable with Eric Young injured is just absolutely dead. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm glad to see Swan get the win. You know, I'm a Swan guy. I kind of but... took Rhino uh, joining by Violent by Design as a sign that. Heath was not coming back to impact. Really? I mean, I don't know if that's true at all, but I just, it, that to me, that kind of signaled that they were moving on. Hmm. So we'll see. It's, it's right. almost, it's coming up to a year almost that he's been out. Yeah. I mean, listen, some injuries are pretty bad. And, you yeah. Know, it is what it is. Um, Matt Cardona and Chelsea Green head to Swingers Palace for a date. Alicia suggests that the team representing Swingers Palace should earn should enter the homecoming king and queen tournament w morrissey comes in and he tells alicia that her husband eddie edwards won't be the same once their hardcore match excuse me after their hardcore match this sunday at homecoming all right tommy dreamer recruits eddie edwards we already talked about this and uh so we know that's going to be the match for next week what do you think of the swingers palace segment so i'm going to be totally honest i actually accidentally fast forwarded through all of this <laughs> uh and the reason was it was getting kind of close i needed to wrap up the show i i was you didn't fast miss forwarding. anything we yeah, know I, they only use swingers palace to make matches bro it's not even talk worth talking about to be honest with you it's like not we even. know they only use swingers palace to make matches and they just use this as um a way to say that matt cardone and chelsea green are going to be in the homecoming tournament and that there would be a swingers palace team in the tournament as well that's it that's all that was yeah I, all right so we had Moose versus Chris Saban in the main event in a rematch from Slammiversary. After Chris Saban defeated Moose at Slammiversary, the self-proclaimed wrestling god demanded a rematch here tonight. Moose catches Saban in midair and whips his head into the steel steps. Moose takes a bottle of water from a fan and splashes splash it in Saban's face before hitting him with one of those just disgustingly loud chops up against the, the ropes. Uh, then Moose took a moment to gloat when Saban capitalized and bit his finger. Saban soared through the air with a huge crossbody to the outside. He spiked Moose on the top rope tornado DDT, but Moose somehow kicked out at two. Moose fought off the cradle shock and then hit the, the lights out spear to win. Uh, after the match, Moose looked to continue the assault, but Saban turns it around and sends Moose retreating with a top rope crossbody. The brawl continued as Impact went off the air. So clearly, Moose and Saban are not finished. There's more to come from this. I actually like it. They have great chemistry in the ring. And I, I you know, I wouldn't mind seeing one more. One more between Moose One more. One more. Um, you're right. They do have chemistry. The match was good. The crowd was really into it. I shook my head because, well, well let, me, let me say a positive here first. I have to give respect to impact that they have they have fought the urge to turn moose baby face we had a whole conversation about Britt baker last week that she was mm. so good at being a heel that they naturally had to turn her baby face you know you've seen guys like kevin owens have that problem uh and they've they have found a way to keep moose a, a heel even when he had the feud with kenny omega and they very easily could have flipped them after that yep. they brought him back to the that they establish him as a heel instantly so it's like moose is the guy that i think they just handle so perfectly it's crazy hmm. the, uh, the last couple of years i just feel like they handle him handle him perfectly um i shook my head because i'm just like chris saban loses the match and moose has tossed him out of the ring and i and my initial re reaction was like what a great heel thing to do to just dump the trash out after beating him right and of course, Saban holds on after after just being pinned 15 seconds before that. Somehow has a second win. Hold, you know, holds on, and they continue. And and I, sometimes it worries me that they're afraid to have guys lose. Sometimes, yeah. They, they always say there's always has to be a justification. That's why you have the ref bumps, the 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 the, uh, the cheating. You see all that all the time because they're afraid for people to lose. And I'm yeah. like. Why didn't why can't just Chris Saban lose? I I feel like they're they're creating a rubber match just to do it. Uh, I I don't I don't know. Um, 
it was a match for slam anniversary that people are like why are we watching this match which the match was good this match was good that's not what i'm not trying to downplay that but it just it's this forced feud and i'm just like why why are they why why are they continuing this but i don't want to write it off without knowing exactly where it's going but i i can handle one more match there's probably gonna be some kind of fucking stipulation some kind of yeah probably, nice, it's probably be a nice street rubber fight. match to you know break the tie and then that's it they both need to move on but they chris saban and moose again they have excellent chemistry in the ring they work really well together so um like i said i, I don't mind signing up for one more all right what'd you think of this show overall dude this was i i, I really did enjoy it from top to bottom you know there's always gonna be the, the the things that i don't care for and i talk a lot about visually and audio the little nuances that just seem to bother me from week to week uh i i watched the whole show almost the whole show with the volume down very low because even just with uh d low and oh my goodness and all that shit i just I, was, I wasn't in the mood for it this week i was just like i'm just gonna appreciate the wrestling um but this was too Good episodes in a row. I think there's only been two for this set of tapings, and I think both have been excellent. And I hope they just like find a way to keep it going, uh, continue the momentum, build from week to week. I think they got very comfortable during the pan doing the pandemic wrestling. Um, I think they were very happy with the pandemic product, and I don't think it was good. I I learned a phrase this week called toxic positivity. <laughs> and it, it's it's like just when when everything is good but the, the people just like, oh every this is so great and you, you just not you ignore that there's so many areas to to improve on or you don't want to admit there's areas to improve on or even like when eric young came out and said oh we have the best audio team in wrestling no you don't i promise you you don't there's probably the worst actually and then right. Sammy saying we we did ba- pandemic wrestling better than anybody. No, you didn't. You no. know, like if you truly that's think that in your head, like that's that's a problem. You know, right? Um, you want to be positive. Don't get me wrong. You don't want just everything be negative. But there's like that toxic positivity. You're just ignoring the the areas that really truly need improvement. Um, or you take offense every time someone someone criticizes something. But this is like two good episodes in a row that I just, I like the, the pace and the flow and, and everything. So, um, I don't remember what they're doing match wise and everything next week. I think they have that tech six man tag, obviously. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm actually kind of looking forward to this homecoming thing. It, it's, it's comprised of like half teams I care about and half. I couldn't give a flying fuck about <laughs> like an absent. Stewardess. Impact. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they just had a, you know, I can't believe suicide's not in this. That's that's you know, but they had to get Petey Williams and Tommy Dreamer. That's Impact Plus. You know, we need to see the Canadian Destroyer and right. uh, Kendo Stick. You know, so <laughs> and I, I the last thing I want to say about this tournament. <clears throat> excuse me. They suck at putting brackets together. Yeah, they the left side of the bracket is so top heavy compared to the other side and that's right. not how you put tournaments together like if you watch sports at all like you don't you know like uh, you, you don't have the uh you know the i'm trying to think this is a weird nba playoffs to use in, as an example but the the suns and jazz didn't play each other in the first round that's that's right. not how that works seating is the word you're looking for R- right you, you have to have seating like, how can you have Cardona and Chelsea Green on one side and then Deanna and whoever her, probably Macklin, is right. her partner? On, and with, like, those are the two teams that you're like, one of those two teams is going to win. Mm-hmm. The other side, you got Petey Williams and, and Jordan Grace. They're not going to win. Tommy Dreamer and Ellering is not going to win. Brian Myers, apparently, his partner's a joke. I, I don't know who who it ultimately who, who it is. And then you got Rosemary and Crazy Steve. Or, okay, cool. They'll probably be in the finals against Dion and whoever I, I I don't really know but when they did the number one contenders world title tournament it was like a year and a half ago they had like Hernandez in it and shit like that I mean one side of the bracket was so heavy the best wrestler on the other side was Ken Shamrock and he didn't even wow. wrestle because they took him out so I mean it, it was just like what are we watching dude it, it just yeah. when you gotta you, you have to keep 
when, when you look in a tournament, the seeding matters, man, so that you can look at it and be like, oh, you know, I, I don't know who's going to be in the finals because ultimately you want the two best teams to be in the finals. You, you don't want them to wrestle in the, in the second round because that's what's going to happen on this. The, the two right. best teams are going to probably wrestle in the second second round. Well, it's a one night round robin, so I mean the good teams got to go against each other. It's not like you have like weeks in between matches to build story, so you know whatever it is, what it is. Yeah. Um. All right. So now let's do from the comment section. This is the part of the show where we let you be a part of the show. Um. You can be a part of the show by just dropping your name and where you're from and your comment for me and or BQ. Uh. Right here below this YouTube video. All right. So. I had the unpleasant pleasure of looking through the comments this week oh. and seeing that a moron jumped in here uh, again with his dumb comments. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, address this real quick before we get started. So <clears throat> oh boy. someone whose name shall be redacted from this conversation says, TW, thanks for the story about Moose and those podcasts. Unfortunately, it creates the opposite effect you wanted mad mad respect for moose it comes across as moose really doesn't care about skin color and doesn't want to be labeled as a black wrestler or a bald wrestler just as a like him even more thank you because just a dumbass comment i'm sorry I Most dumbass part of all, it judged as they on, on their skin color. That just shows that you don't know how to listen to a conversation and you don't know how to uh, comprehend what the meaning of the conversation is so that you can reply with something that actually adds value to that conversation. For anybody who didn't see the show last week, I mentioned how Moose has a habit of uh, getting into, you know, little Twitter beefs with podcasters and they seemingly often happen to be black podcasters. And that seems weird to me because as a black wrestler, you see when um, different, you know, different, different uh, people are using their platforms and they're trying to, you know, shout out the different black wrestlers, you know, help uplift them. Listen, like let's, let's not play, uh, let's not play dumb here. Like people like to put their heads in the sand on uh, conversations like this and act like they don't see the different like racial elements that that exist you know up until the last year right like wwe has been the worst of the worst in terms of uh racial representation on their product and on wrestling in general across the board right like you don't necessarily see black performers featured in the top spots. I mean, Lashley had a great run in Impact a few years ago. Uh, Jay Lethal had a good run in ROH a few years ago. Um, but for the most part, those things are sprinkled, you know, they're, they're, they're sprinkled in, right? Um, which that doesn't even really matter. That's, that's not even relevant to this conversation. My point was, you know, you see, let me pull up, let me pull something up real quick here. Let me, let me, let me jump in Google, doing this in real time here, people. Let me pull up the 2020 PWI 500. Okay. All right. Let me pull up this list here. And Wikipedia, is this Wikipedia? Go ahead and hit this list for me. Okay. Boom. They got them. Okay. Boom. They got it. So I'm a, I'm a go down this list here. This is the PWI 500 for 2020. Okay. And now I'm looking for Moose. I want to see where Moose was ranked on the PWI 500 for 2020. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. I'm at number 61. Still no Moose. <laughs> scrolling. Still scrolling. Well, he does. I just want I'm to read mine. 100. Still no Moose. Okay, let me see. Let me keep going. While he's doing that, I just want to remind people that Kara Hogan is beautiful, and I'm going to miss her on my screen. That's yeah, what I was thinking when, when she was cutting this promo with Tasha Steeles today. I was like, man. Did she say anything good in her promo? <laughs> well, oh, you found him. <laughs> Moose was ranked at number 148 on the PWI 500 for 2020. Okay, 
<clears throat> now, by the way, being ranked number 148 out of 500 wrestlers, that's 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 not bad, right? 148 out of 500, that's not terrible. Um, but I didn't hear Moose have any sort of qualms or problems about being ranked number 148 on the PWI 500. But he had beef with the Black Wrestling Podcast ranking him at number 38 on their list of the top 50 black wrestlers in the business. And so he went out of his way to tell them, hey, take me off the list, which is again, pretty much just, if, if he had been ranked in the top five on that, I guarantee you he wouldn't have been wanted to take it off the list, right? But he was probably offended at being ranked number 38 on a list as opposed to, you're ranked number 140 something on the PWI and you got nothing to say about that, but you got a problem with the black podcasters put you on the ranking. Like that's weird to me again, that's weird to me. So, and, and again, and, and there was another instance um, just rehashing the conversation because somebody stupid made a stupid comment where someone made a graphic. I believe it was the public enemies podcast. They were, excited about the uh bobby lashley kofi kingston match that was coming up and they said hey it's not so often that you get to see you know two black wrestlers competing for in the main event for the world title and they listed a few other times that it happened and one of them that wasn't listed was moose versus uh rich swan and then moose you know jumps in you know and he's you know basically insulting them you know telling their their trach was their, their take was trash or something like that and again so you're publicly attacking this, you know, this, 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 this podcast with like 3000 followers, right. Uh, as, as opposed to, you know, some major publication. Um, and again, weird to me because I don't see him doing this to bigger, you know, more established, um, uh, uh accounts. Right. So that all just always seems weird to me. You would think again, like, knowing the the wrestling business knowing the corporate world in general you see people trying to build themselves up especially you you expect a little solidarity among you know like you know people you know fellow black people trying to you know create their brand and and promote their brand and all the other stuff but it's just weird to me that he finds himself attacking these 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 people often <clears throat> so anyway i expressed that that idea and this dummy jumped into the comments of the show and said that, that that gave him more respect for Moose. And that tells me that you just hate black people. I don't know how else to tell it, but you just, you just have some sort of problem with anything that, you know, involves black people. And again, at the end of the day, that is a you problem. Okay. Like I'm not out here trying to um, start up no inflammatory racial conversation, but something in you gets offended when you hear anything is centric centered around black people and again that's a you problem so you deal with it or you can go listen to something else because i don't know what to tell you bro i'm never ever 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 gonna not talk about things because they're black centric you know what i mean like if that bothers you listen to something else you know what i mean bq does up plenty of uploads where i'm not on them if you want to listen to one that I'm not on, then you go ahead and do that. But I'm going to be me. I'm going to talk about things that I think are fun and relevant and cool. And if that bothers you, if that makes you butt hurt, then kick rocks. Okay. Cause I, you know what I mean? Like I don't really have room or time to keep addressing stupidity. You want to keep jumping in the comments with your dumb stuff. Um, I'm not going to keep responding to it. You know what I mean? I'm not going to keep responding to it. So uh, you be you crawl in your hole and go touch yourself to videos of the January 6th uh, Capitol rights. Wow. And I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what else to tell you because that's, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I just, I, you know, I, I don't know. If you you hear or say, you, you hear people talking about anything that involves black people and that makes you offended, that's a you problem. Back to the fun, back to the wrestling podcast. Back to the comments, people who actually want to talk about the podcast that we were actually doing. And starting with Lee, Impact Wrestling supporter. He says, I love to see the Bullet Club in Impact Wrestling. The full group, even more. The full group, even Chris Bay, he's very talented. So I just take that to mean that he, that, that Lee, 
likes to see Chris Bay as part of the Bullet Club. What do you think of the idea of Chris Bay as part of the Bullet Club? You know, as I said earlier, I think it's the best thing that can happen for his career uh, because this was a dude that when Impact signed him, a lot of people who don't follow the product are like, oh, you, you guys are knocking off Kofi Kingston. And, and granted, I made the comparison earlier because of the color of his outfit. But, uh, you know, this helps him. The Bullet Club is like the the polar opposite of New Day, you know, so right. <laughs> I think it's good to to associate himself with with a group like that someone uh, you know a group that's popular and impact has always been on the outside looking in when it came to the bullet club you know they had some representation at one point obviously in ring of honor and then new japan they had representation in wwe and then impact was just the one that was like you know right it's like the the meme of the dragons i don't know if you know what i'm talking about it'll show like three badass dragons and then one like retarded one no, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> up the show. <laughs> up the show. Like there was one recently that came out. I had I took a little offense to it, but it said like Dodgers, Giants, Padres. You know, with these like mean dragons, and then the yeah. one all retarded said Angels. And I'm like, hey, let's let's watch it there. Let's watch it. Oh. But um, that's what you know. Like Impact Wait, was on their own. Teams is yours. The, the Angels is my team. Oh God, I thought you said Dodgers, man. No, no, no. I am a fan of LA's second team in every sport. Yeah. That's, that's just the way I roll. Um, so I'm, I'm allowed Indiana to have a mid. Team. I'm allowed to have a Midwest team, though. I live out here, so what's yeah. that? Uh, but it's it's just good to have them associated with them, and um, just for the longest time, Impact was on their own island of, of right. wrestling. No one acknowledged them, and all that. So. It's a good look. Uh, when I knew someone was joining the Bullet Club, I could not, for the life of me, figure out who it could be. And and he's the one that makes sense. Right. I just completely overlooked him. But he he's just such a good talent that he just deserves to be on that. You know, to, I he, like the idea of Chris Bay in the Bullet Club. Um, as this story is starting to play out, I'm not so sure it's going to happen. Um, this might be something where he and Jay White end up coming to odds, and it doesn't actually materialize. But listen, if the if the, if if the plan's not set in stone, I like the idea of Chris Bay joining the Bullet Club um, because I think it'd be good for the Bullet Club, and I think it'd be good for Chris Bay, and I think it'd be good for Impact. You know, let let him do something that's a little more high profile, um, so that when he does come back to Impact and he's on Impact more regularly, you know, that's just another thing to add to his um, add to his toolbox. You know, of of making people like him. So um, yeah, I, I say do it. All right, so next we got Emmanuel Rosario says, the fans at the tapings were loud. I was there and we were red hot. Yes, you were, Emmanuel Rosario. So shout yes. out to you yes. and uh, everyone else who was there. Like I said, y'all have made these past couple of shows amazing to watch and keep doing it. Keep doing it. When you go in there, make the show your own, man. Like yeah. just go in there and set the tone, be a part of the show. There's the people in the ring and there's the people in the crowd and the people in the crowd means so much to the product. So I am fully empowering all of you to go in there and have as much fun as you want to from the time you walk in to the time you leave. Cause it makes it a better show for me at home. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Uh, let's see. Blurs. Blur. Blur Siders 21 says the Omega Josh segment was great. So was the Deanna Mickey segment. Bay joined the Bullet Club would be interesting. Hopefully they can have other knockouts go for the tag titles since there's only Grace Ellering and Susan Kimber. All right. A few different comments there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I like the uh, Omega Josh segment. Like I said, we didn't do world title watch, but you already know, guys, where I, I hope this is going, and I just hope they stay on track with it, man. Like, keep building Josh Alexander. Keep giving him opponents. Let him run through people. Put great moments, great matches in the bank. And the idea here is that we're 
and there's just going to be Kenny Omega and Josh Alexander having beaten pretty much everybody else and just staring straight across from each other. And then we got a money match for Bound for Glory. So that's what I'm hoping for. Um, BQ, what do you think of that? He, he he had a few a few different things there. Anything stand out to you? Um, no, nah, I think he summed it up. All right, cool. All right, so Kobe F, a consistent commenter here, says. This was a good episode. A lot of focus on Chris Bay, which was cool. Uh, but they need to get out of Skyway Studios soon. They need a different venue and a feel to the show. Um, I'm going to say I don't agree with you, Kobe. I don't agree with you because I think that by keeping this small venue and by keeping, if you can have a small group of energetic fans who come in there and make the show feel alive, I think you're going to create an atmosphere that's going to allow for more fans when you go back out on the road. And they're going to be, again, used to hearing and seeing an exciting, lively product from Impact. So they're going to be that when they come to the show. So I say, damn it, keep it in Skyway Studios as long as you want to. And just make sure you keep that crowd lively and and participating in the show and making it fun for everybody because i think it's going to pay off huge when they go back on the road what do you think i'm kind of under the impression with these with these tapings that a a good portion of these people are from out of town Mm -hmm. which i don't know i don't normally feel that way i feel like usually it's it's fairly local and and they will get anyone in who will buy a ticket you know, I, I think I think there's more out of towners with this one. I'm and I'm jealous because I, I've said this last couple of shows. Nashville isn't that far from me. It just would have been irresponsible of me to um to take more vacation time to go to these tapings and to go to Slammiversary when I was just in Hawaii for a week. Right. Uh paying five hundred dollars a night for a hotel. Woo. So <laughs> that was with military discount too. My goodness. So that shit was ridiculous. But um it would have just been irresponsible for me to do that. Um, so I, I chose to stay home, but I, I'm jealous of the people who are there. I do agree in the sense with Skyway studios, they've been doing it for so long. It's the, every show just really feels the same to me. And that's, I know, I know I jokingly, not jokingly, cause I mean it, but I'm always talking about the wheel on the night show and, and, and things like that. I mean, song you have to switch shit up and it's like you watch the show it's like the roman reigns promo the other day where john cena is like missionary position every night right like it just it's just the same song the same camera angles the entrances all look exactly the same there's one predominant color the backstage segments are all done in three or four different places some of them look like broom closets Mm -hmm. um you know, like when Scott Demore steps out of his office, which I'm pretty sure is the same one that is Kenny Omega's, you know, they, I think they just switched the thing. Dude, I'm pretty sure that's just a little like, y- you know, they make it look like it's an office. It's, it's probably a damn closet. And um, when he steps out of it, it's probably the same hallway that they move a plant into and shoot the Tennille All About Me interview segment. R- right. <laughs> um, and they play that off on TV. Like this looks like Madison Rain segment, you know. Right. Um, but it, you know, when there was the when when uh, Finn Juice got attacked today, and he threw Juice Robinson through the door, and I saw the hallway open. I felt like I saw a whole area of the arena that they don't go into. True. I was just like, oh wait, 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 go back, go go in there. You know, it's the same back door. You know, they're waiting by the back door and, and they have conversations or they're running into each other in the same places. It's just so th- that's why, you know, that's kind of why I say, well, switch the song up, do something like mm. you, you got to add, especially when there's OK, slam anniversary hit. That's a good reset time. How can we make the show feel a little bit different? Yeah. And uh, they're so locked into this cookie cutter way of how they do Skyway Studios that it's I'm, I'm just ready to see something else i do that with the channel every major pay-per-view and shit i switch up the thumbnails and i do i mean i I, i'm just always under that mindset like every time there's a a new era of something going on okay how do i change what i do um so i'm ready for them for that reason i'm but i'm afraid for them to go okay now we're gonna go to um bumblefuck fucking you know i i 
trying to think. I don't want to disrespect where anyone lives. Some say, and then all of a sudden the fans are right back to where, you know, sitting on their right. hands. I, I'm very worried that that's going to happen. Yeah. No, again, and that's why I say to me, it's better to condition your audience. And if you, if you can keep a small audience and condition them to be lively, then that's going to lead to bigger audiences who are conditioned to be lively when they're at your show. So to me, I don't care. Like, again, you know, look at, you know, Monday Night Raw or SmackDown. All those shows look exactly the same. Ever since, like, you know, I don't know if, if, if you really, like, noticed that, but but probably, um, gosh, I want to say in the, the, from the early 2000s on, there was, like, a string of new arenas popping up all over the country. Prior to that, arenas did look different on the inside. But now most arenas look pretty much the same on the inside. And I, I made that point just to say that if you watch Monday Night Raw or SmackDown, it doesn't matter what town is coming from. It all looks the same. It all looks the same because they're all the arenas are set up basically the same. The set and stage for Monday Night Raw or SmackDown are all the same. You can't tell where it is. So honestly, the arena that you're coming from doesn't really matter. What matters is the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is made by the fans. So you don't answer that by going to a different town. Like famously, whenever WWE goes to Corpus Christi, Texas, the, the crowd is terrible. Um, they're just they're just they're just not a loud town. They they don't you know participate in the show that way. Uh, and famously, when they go to Philly, the crowd is obnoxious and right. and and crazy and you know that that type of thing. Um, so yes, that's part of it. But if you can cultivate something like what NXT has right in in uh, that Florida studio, it's probably the same. It's probably. 80% the same people shuffling in and out of every show. But the 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 they're conditioned, right? That you 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 cheer about everything, yeah. you boo everything, you do stupid chants, and that makes the show lively. People see it and they say, I want to be a part of that. So when you announce that you're bringing your show to Philly for Royal Rumble weekend you sell out a 10,000 seat arena because they all want to come do the stupid chance. And right. I used to hate that, but I'm fine with it now. If that's going to make the impact show closer to the NXT show, you know what I mean? The biggest part of NXT is the audience. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you take that audience away from NXT and their impact. And, um, <laughs> right. and, and so if you can keep, even if you keep impact fans to that smaller confined venue, I don't mind if, if they're being loud and active as opposed to sitting on their hands. So I'll take the small venue with the small crowd. If it's a lively crowd, as opposed to a bigger venue of people sitting on their hands. Right. And NWA is another example where pre pandemic, their crowds were just stupid hot. So when I go to the, the NWA uh, pay-per-view, the, the um, empower, and then I'm going to one set of tapings. I'm already feeling like I have to bring energy when I go to that show. You know, I, I'm, I'm, when you go to that show, you have to promise me that you're going to boo Deanna Perrazzo. Do not cheer for Deanna Perrazzo and do not chant Virtuosa. I'm not going to chant Virtuosa. Okay. I don't do chant. I, I try not to do chants. Uh, <laughs> it would be hard for me to boo her. Norm at an impact setting, I would, but um, she deserves to be booed. Have you have you seen? Are you familiar with Genocide, who's in NWA? Like I don't, I know you don't really watch the product, but she's she she wrestled in AEW on Dark a couple of times. She's she wears face paint like she's a giant robot, sort of. Okay. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> she's like very hot. Okay. <laughs> and it was kind of like Sue Young the first time you see her without makeup. You know, back in the day, you're like whoa, why does right. she, why is she wearing <laughs> makeup? It's Same right. with uh, yeah. Abaddon and AEW, like. <laughs> Uh, she's actually really attractive too. So it, is it, she really? Yeah. So it, 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 yeah, <laughs> she she got a little <laughs> thicker, but like in in the face, she's beautiful. So it, it it's just funny that sometimes people just just cover that up. But that's just totally off uh off topic. But um, yeah, I'm going to these shows expecting 
I got to bring energy. And when I used to go to the impact zone in Orlando, you know, I'm just like, you know, I, I, I never desire to be one of the people standing on camera. Yeah. Because I was just like, they're not going to be doing anything. So let me find a chair somewhere. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. So again, but lately the fans have been matching that energy. And so I want more of that. Whatever you yeah. got to do to make more of that, make more of that. Yes. All right. So Anonymous Gaming says, will Matt bring the GCW title and gimmick to Impact? The match was awesome and the crowd was the most crazy I have ever seen. So that's a good question. Uh, I'm sure you know about the news. Matt Cardona went in the GCW title. That was big news. They had to get that title off of Nick Gage before he went to AEW and lost to Chris Jericho. So they gave it to Matt Cardona. And Matt Cardona, instead of going, woo, 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 why don't you like me? He said, screw you guys. I'm big time. And I loved it. I said, if you're going to be heel, this is the way to do it. And I wouldn't mind seeing that version of Matt Cardona in yeah. Impact Wrestling. Yeah. He would, I mean, he could probably have a very EC3-esque resurgence to his career if he if he went that route. Totally um, agree. You know, I'm going to say I've never been super familiar with Nick Gage. I knew he uh, he has the Dark Side of the Ring episode and, and all that. And I was very confused because, like, he's alive. How come he has an episode? But... Um, (laughs) I've become familiar with him over the last couple months and I didn't watch the match with Jericho yet. I just, I just haven't finished the AEW episode. Mm. Um, I kind of stand by what I said is that it's a very small portion of the Bischoff was saying this. I hate Eric Bischoff with passion, but he was saying this. I I read an excerpt very similar to to what I say, where a, a very small portion of the wrestling audience actually enjoys that level of hardcore wrestling. Um, it, at one point it was very popular and it, it was great, but how many p- pizza cutters have we seen on TV in the last like month, dude? I mean, I mean this is like, now it's just becoming yeah. the new kendo stick. I don't, I don't want to spoil the, uh, the AEW main event for you, but it wasn't for me. It okay. wasn't for me. It was, I mean, like you watch it and you, cause you and me have a different, different opinions on a lot of stuff. That's honestly a big reason why I think, you know, this, this show is good is because we don't just agree and we're not like yes banning each other. Yeah. Uh, like you, we have different, different opinions on stuff. So you might love the show. Like definitely text me after you finish watching it. Okay. I watched it and it wasn't for me. I was like, you know, I thought, and I'm sure you heard the, the controversy about Domino's and the pizza cutter. <laughs> yes. That was such an unfortunate coincidence. For anybody who didn't see it, they did a spot in the match with Nick Gage and Jericho where <laughs> Nick Gage takes a pizza cutter and runs it across Jericho's forehead. And he does this right before they go to a picture-in-picture commercial break. And the first sponsor up is Domino's. <laughs> and uh, Domino's was not happy about this. They publicly disavowed any knowledge of you know of 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 that although that would have been a really clever you know (laughs) planning if they had done it that way but dominoes said hell no and i think that's the the hard lesson the aw is going to learn from this which is that like you know look that that's not for everybody that's a very you know core niche um segment of the fan base who likes that kind of stuff yeah right and it's it's, it's not for everybody and yeah and so i, I don't among think the ones that, that that's not for me that that shit is trash yeah so i don't think um and and you when i've been saying this recently it's more about hardcore wrestling in general but more like the silly hardcore wrestling yeah but I, but i have been saying i think that audience is getting smaller and smaller and smaller that cares that wants to see weapons and all that kind of crap in a match uh so i don't think he's going to bring the title to the show but it would be interesting if he that edge that he is learning right now with that character and, you know, for that audience, because they were throwing bottles at him and all sort like, I haven't seen that since, you know, the NWA stuff. I mean, NWA, right. <laughs> uh, uh, not NWA, uh, NWO. NWO. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, wow, you know, I can't yeah. believe he got, so it would be great to see him tap into that um, for mm. impact and to give him some, you know, actually remember, when Bully Ray revealed that he was the leader of the Aces and Nates, people threw a lot of trash in the, in the oh, ring yeah. that night. That's a, that, see, TNA doesn't get the credit. TNA does not get credit for some of <laughs> yeah. the moments that they put together. But yeah, man, like I said, I definitely want, I'm interested in hearing your opinion after you watch it. I um, I mean, like, look, man, to, to me, like, quick little sidebar. 
a big reason why I'm not a fan, and hey, you guys can participate in this too. Tell us what you think of, of the hardcore GCW style wrestling, Nick Gage, death matches, all that type of stuff. My opinion on it is this. Like, wrestling is an art, right? The art of wrestling is to make me at home feel like I'm watching a fight. But I know it's not a fight. And so I don't, when, when you go out of your way to actually hurt the other person, it's dead damn obvious, okay? When the line is crossed between wrestling and realness, it just makes the wrestlers look stupid and bad and unprofessional. There's certain wrestlers who, you know, I'm not going to throw out any names here, but they have reputations for actually hurting people when they're in the ring. And some wrestlers hurt people by mistake in the ring a lot. And it just makes them look bad. It takes away from the entertainment value of wrestling. Like conversely, when, when somebody's laying in some stiff chops, that's fine. It makes me go, ooh. But again, it's me appreciating the art form, right? When I see Sasha Banks dive off the top rope with the meteor, that's the two knees straight to the head and landing straight on the mat. Every time I see it, I'm like, ooh. But again, that's wrestling. When I see you take a effing pizza cutter and run it across somebody's head, you can't fake that. That's just stupid. I just looked at it and I go, why would you do that? Why would you agree to let somebody do that to you? It doesn't make sense. You know right. what I mean? Like, so I don't know, but to each their own, that, that, that type of super duper hardcore is not, not, not my cup of tea. If Sasha Banks did the meteor, meteor to meteor to me, I'd moan. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that right there yeah. all right <laughs> um, oh man all right let me see let me see let me see what we got here um okay so von vil von vile says it isn't that Impact isn't willing to pay. The problem is Impact encourages talent to leave or scout other promotions. Hopefully, Kiara will see Impact is the place for her. Like Trey Miguel, she isn't going to WWE because they have to protect Sasha Banks. Going to AEW. With them not caring. um interesting comment um getting paid sounds pretty great when you're used to not getting paid i can tell you that um <laughs> i saw somebody commented to uh tyler breeze uh about how his career is a failure and, and, and tyler breeze re re replied to him like i'm a millionaire and i have three houses and i was like checkmate you know right, what I mean? right. Like, people can say what they want like you know same thing um you know mike and maria they, they certainly did not have a successful character wise wwe run but they show pictures of their house online and the shit is beautiful i think they got two or three kids and you know and they live comfortably off the money they made on wwe so i will never in a million years fault somebody for getting paid you know what i mean like the the whole point of doing smaller promotions is you hope that you're going to catch the eye of a promotion that's really going to pay you Sorry to pull right. the curtain back, but that's the game, people. And so um, if Kiera Hogan believes that there's a check out there for her, I by all means encourage her to go get it. That said, you know, I already said how I felt about this last week. I do think she'll have a tough time out there because people are just going to make the visual comparison to Sasha Banks, which, again, is, you know, not fair. But it's also, you know, a, a comparison that I don't think Kiera Hogan as currently constructed you know, can really measure up to. So um, I'm interested to see what's next for her. You know, I wish her all the best. Um, but, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Any thoughts on that? No. You know, I think when she first started appearing on the show, when she started coloring her hair, she and she colored her hair blue before Sasha Banks did. Mm -hmm. Um she used to kind of just have one solid color and then all of a sudden she started fading it and, and mixing colors. And like now even her eyelashes were different colors this episode. So I think she's done enough to uh, 
create her own look at this point. I think there's one point where she, you could say, oh, well, she's trying to be, which we know that was bullshit, but right. there was a point where you could look at, well, she's trying to be Sasha. But um, I, I think she's done a good job in creating her own look. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh, we'll take one more. Let's see. <laughs> a few comments about Kara Hogan. A few comments about who's the real leaders of the Bullet Club. It's us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we are. <laughs> uh, we up, we, we're the puppet masters behind the string, behind the scenes, yeah. pulling the strings. Let's see. All right, we'll end with a, set, a simple comment. Kevin Kidd says, Impact is great again. Do you agree? Yeah, this this is the best it's been in a while just based off these two episodes alone i think i think there's still a lot they got to do continue the momentum i think there's lots of areas for improvement still but it just you know i think i've used this example a few times but there was a a time where i I was stationed in um, florida and i was an instructor and we taught uh, we trained troops before they deployed before they um went overseas and after every class session you know, we, it was a 17 week course, 17 day course, not 17 week, geez, 17 day course. We always sat down every time like clockwork. How do we make the next class better? Uh, and we would never leave the room until we had three, three good and three bad on the board. What's three things that we're bad. We have to fix next time. And what are the three things we need to continue? Um, so anyone that, done a military time knows that as an after actions report. And I always felt like impact just didn't do that. They didn't go from taping to taping saying, what do we continue? That's good. What needs to be, what needs to improve? I, I thought that under the Dixie Carter era, I, I, cause I always felt like every time there's a new set of tapings on TV, it was just clear when that, when that day started, I just always felt like there was just something, something different in the show where this one, I never know um, if it's day one of tapings day two. I don't know mm. whether to take a shit or wind my watch. Like I'm, I'm completely like clueless because everything feels the same, but with this particular set, I feel like they finally did that. I feel like there was just, there was little, not everything, but I thought I, I I just picked up on little things that I was like, yo, they they saw how things were over this past year, and we we got to make some little improvements. I I'm starting to feel that with this set of tapings here, like that they're making an effort finally. Be like, okay, let's fix this, let's fix this, let's fix this. So I am very optimistic that as the year rolls on, it's going to improve. The problem was once they get to like December, they get real fucking lazy. We're, we're usually around Bound for Glory, they start to. They start to get lazy, and by the end of the year, it's like, oh my god! I hope that it's not like that this year. I hope that they yeah. can they they just continue to try to get better and better and better. But this is the best right now. Um, it, it's been in a long time. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I got two points here. Uh, one, I saw a tweet um, where somebody somebody actually like quote tweeted this, but the 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 tweet was. Um, Jay White, Kenny Omega, and Francine from ECW all appeared on Impact last night. And I thought about that and I was like, damn, like that should be like an action packed show that lots of people were talking about. And I see it getting, I see it getting no traffic. And so, you know, what Impact has to understand is it's not just about having a good show. And I think this has been the, you know, consistent history of Impact. Like here sitting here in 2021, we look back at 2017 and go, damn, they had a nice little roster of dudes they could have done something with. And then for in 2017, we look back at 2013 and go, damn, Impact was hot. Yeah. They were touring. They were, you know, they had all these guys. They had a nice mix of legends and up and comers. They should do something, you know what I mean? And I bet in 2013, they look back and said, damn, in 20 in, in, in 08, we were so hot. We had hot, you know? And so that's just, I think, consistently been the problem with Impact. And to me, it all goes back to properly promoting the product. It's not just about having a good show. They put on a good show consistently. 
So it's not just about having a good show. You got to promote it. You got to create conversation around it. It's that whole, if a tree falls in the forest thing, okay? If you put on a great show and nobody watches it, who the fuck cares? It doesn't yeah. matter, right? Like you got to, you got to get people talking about this show. Again, like major stars from so many promotions have appeared on Impact in the last two weeks. Impact should be the talk of the wrestling business right now, okay? Um, they got to do a better job of promoting this product and raising the profile of this product. The other thing I was going to say is I saw uh, a news item today that Jeff Jarrett has been quietly released from WWE. Yeah. Now, look, I know that Jeff Jarrett butted heads with Impact, but you know that the most interesting time in Impact TNA's recent history was when they brought Jeff Jarrett back and he just did such a great job creating publicity. Yeah. Hire Jeff J. Jar- I know he butted heads with Anthem. I know he had his drinking problems and all of that. If you can vet him and get him to a place you can trust, give this man some sort of producer job where it's his job to create buzz for the show because he knows how to do that. I would be, tell me fans, drop, drop in the comments, what would you guys think? Would you guys be in favor of Impact bringing in Jeff Jarrett in some sort of, uh, you know, um, Gosh, I don't even know what to call it. Some sort of like an advisor specialist roles, some sort of advisory consultant role where, yeah. you know, he could, they use him to help create buzz for the product. I think he would be absolutely great at that. I think he's made for that kind of thing. You know, just don't give him too much responsibility or, you know, too much power within the company. Um, to me, that'd be a great way to bring Jeff Jarrett on and, uh, you know, let him still contribute to, to, to a very much needed aspect of Impact Wrestling. Yeah, and he was he was good for the digital product too. He had a lot of very original ideas for YouTube. Um he I mean he he had buzz around Global Force Wrestling, you know, the the uh, the original. Granted, mm-hmm. we look at it as a, as a joke now, but I mean one of the hottest times I've ever had on this channel was when Jeff Jarrett was around. When they yeah, rebranded yeah, that's, what I, that's what I was referring to. Right. When he when they rebranded to Global Force Wrestling, that hurt hurt the impact lounge a lot because all of a sudden they start trying to erase the TNA and impact names and that that's what's in the search engine. So it, it was um a little hurtful, but when he was around, that was the, it, it was, there was a lot of optimism. He, he would sign guys or bring them in and they were just very fresh from each other. You know, like when Ace Austin was initially signed, I was like, dude, he feels like, I, I feel a little differently now, but at the time I was like, dude, he feels like no, no different from wrestler, whatever in the X division. Like I, I just, I, I felt like everything just, no one stood out, you know? And, um, Jeff had a, a good knack for, on, for, for, you know, he brought in guys like Kevin Matthews, you know, KM Congo Kong, um, you, you know, uh, guys who were pr- came off as pretty TV ready, even though they hadn't yeah. been on TV. You know, um, Good point. when he left, when there was that period where they had a rebrand back to impact, that was some of the absolute worst television that this company has put on uh, between him leaving and Anthem taking over. There was like that period of a few months where it was horrible. It got ugly. It got ugly yeah. for a little bit. But yeah, I, I totally agree, man. So um, I don't know, man. You got anything else for today? No, nah, dude. Not Nothing. Nothing. So that's your fix, ladies and gentlemen, Impact Lounge. That's your fix for this week. Once again, please make sure that you like this video so everybody knows how much you love it. Go ahead, press it right now. Press the like, press the thumbs up button. Uh, Hit the subscribe button if you're not already subscribed to this channel. Hit the notification bell so you know each and every time we drop some new content on this channel. And most importantly, post this video on your friend's wall. Email it to somebody. Clip it off, share it on YouTube, okay? Tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's bring more people into the conversation. Follow BQ on social. BQ, tell the people where they can find you on social. BQ Speaks on Twitter. And you can also now follow the uh, Impact Lounge on Twitter because I've been, uh, I finally got that account back. So you can uh, check both of those out. Very nice. You can follow me on Twitter at TW Talk About. You can follow my separate podcast page at T, uh, at 
talking about pod tweet me i tweet back let's get into some conversations i live tweet impact i live tweet raw i live tweet uh aew all of that and sometimes i'll tweet it a couple days after the fact because i have a life and i'm not sitting in front of tv for hours <laughs> watching wrestling all right but but i do want to interact with all of you uh let's talk let's chat most importantly let's come back next week for another dose of the cool factor i'm your host tw peace